Hello, my name is Alan Fu, and today I'm going to talk about lateral interpretation, interpolation of geophysical properties using gridding, mainly for well ties, but also for other things. So where does this fit in? So this is a flowchart showing seismic interpretation workflow. So initially you will make your interpretation in time domain, assuming you're working in time domain data. Then you make your velocity analysis to convert it into depth because you won't need final results in depth domain. Then you do an initial depth conversion with various QC and sensitivities to make sure that it basically looks plausible. Then you make sure that the whales tie if it's not done initially within the uh, depth model to produce a final depth map. And then you do various QCs and sensitivities just to make sure everything looks okay before you pass on your depth model to your geologist, to your engineer for building a geological model in something like Petrel and a reservoir simulator model in Eclipse. So many depth conversion methods don't initially tie the well markers with complete accuracy. Whether you're working in time domain or whether you're working in depth domain, some depth domain models don't fit the well data exactly. And I've got a video on that. And the well data is real and needs to be honored. So why do wells not initially tie? Well, you could be that you seismic interpretation time doesn't match the check shot time to do with imaging migration. Or your velocity uh, parameters are average and are not fully well specific and need to be corrected. So you can think about what domain you're going to tie in, whether you're going to tie it in time domain to make sure that uh, the check shot time fits uh, the interpretation time. I wouldn't advise that, but some people do. Whether you tie in the velocity domain, which is one of the domains I would recommend, you tie in the depth domain. You could use an automatic tie. Uh, this is something that there's a default in Petrel and you need to switch it off to make sure you don't do it. Or you can use a correction grid, which is what I could recommend. Alternatively, manually hand counted local edits. I don't believe you can do that in Petrel, but you can do that in things like CPS, CMAP, and some of those other products. So, well data sparse, but it's also hard data, and you need to make a map or a grid of velocity properties that covers the entire of interest. And that's done by interpolating the well derived properties using an algorithm. The various algorithms that exist, they all have benefits and drawbacks. We also use similar interpolation techniques for some geological properties, for example, layer thickness, net to gross, porosity. Uh, some people do it for saturation. I'd prefer to use the porosity saturation function, but that's a matter of personal uh, taste. So um, where do we need to interpolate well data? Now for depth conversion using functions such as V0K, uh, whether using velocity maps, whether using seismic velocities, or whether using depth domain data. Now, functions, you'll map a variable such as the V0. In its velocity maps, you'll map the velocity map. With processing velocities, you need a mapping correction surface, which corrects for anisotropy, particularly working with older data, which is not um, anisotropic, which is isotropic, not anisotropic. It doesn't take anisotropy into account. Uh, please have a look at my video on depth domain uh, seismic. And depth domain data also needs the final grid to honor the data. So what is gridding? So gridding is you produce a grid of values with a regular spacing. Now, uh, the x, y, x and y spacing need not be the same. It normally is, but it need not be the same. And you would have a value at each one of these nodes. And this would be created. Uh, by interpolating data from data points. Now, these grid values can then be contoured uh, in, a 3D map, in a map or a 3D viewer. They can be mathematically manipulated, you know, added, subtracted, etc., to produce various derivative grids to produce maps. Now, there are several traditional gridding algorithms that are in existence. Um, least squares uh, plane, that's traditionally most used, 1 over r squared, so that's effectively like gravity distance from the interpolating distances from the uh, well points, uh, distance weighted average, polynomial functions, convergent, which is a default in CPS and betrayal, minimum curvature, B spline, closest points of snap, that's only really applicable to very dense data. So you turn a regular data set into a grid, for example, a 3D interpretation, and Krieging. So each algorithm has advantages and drawbacks, terms of calculating speed, variability, etc. And uh, Kevin Ward of uh, PetroSize has done quite a little bit of work on that. You, uh, please check out their YouTube channel. So this is an example of different um, algorithms and their different effects. So minimum curvature, least squares, polynomials, this is the weighted average, etc. Please check out some of their uh, work. Uh, they're a company that provides various mapping softwares. 
Then you look at uh, things that you do to make your grid look sensible. So for example, you can have limits, you can have smoothing, you can have boundaries. So you can have a limiting polygon there. Zmap calls it a data hull, which is, make, which is where you make sure that the data doesn't extrapolate beyond a certain geographical area limited by a polygon. You can also have a bounded range in terms of Z values. Uh, this is quite often used for things like porosity and SW, water saturation, where the range needs to be zero and one, therefore you put that limit in there. You can also put limits in the correction grids to make sure it doesn't go uh, outside your range exactly by a, lot, by a long time. You can also have directional trends, so you can bias your interpretation a specific direction rather than being um, purely based on one overall. That can be based on geological understanding. You can use fault traces within that to limit, uh, again, your interpolation. And you can use very smoothing factors to make sure that it looks uh, reasonably OK. Uh, Krieging is, uh, or Krieging is a slightly more sophisticated way of interpolating. So it's a geostatistical method using Gaussian processes uh, produced by covariances. So you have distances, you have sills, you have uh, nuggets, etc. cetera. Uh, hard points are fixed. The function produces variable values within the envelope. And you can use that, uh, instead of having one deterministic way, you can use that to stochastically produce a whole series of uh, different uh, values. Uh, you can have spatial constraints using the semi-variogram. Variability of the data increases relative to distance. So again, SIL, where the model flattens out, range, distance of the model flattens out, and nugget, the semi-variogram intercepts at the y-axis. So that's right here. So again, used for geostatistics, a lot more sophisticated than the uh, traditional algorithms. Do you really need it? Perhaps, perhaps not. So fitting the world's basic workflow. You start off with a simple rule grid with locations uh, with an XYZ point set for your well locations. You then sample your grid, analyze the difference. So what's your min, your max, your histogram of the differences. Produce a correction surface from the difference point set. Review the correction surface. Subtract the difference to produce a fitted grid. Then you QC the fitted grid to make sure it looks OK. And you check for distortions with maps and sections. So uh, in 3D surveys, for example, they're done at uh, velocity picking is generally done at about one kilometer intervals, occasionally 500 meter intervals. So you get this regular grid of values and then you have a grid of wells. So when you're looking at using seismic velocities, this is what you're trying to tie. So where do you tie? Do you tie in time domain? Do you tie in velocity domain? Do you tie in a depth domain? OK, time domain, I don't like it. Check your interpretation, check the horizon pick data, you have statics and migration and tie variant and grid. Now it's worth your while checking it. So if something is migrated not quite in the right place, you know that it's, uh, that uh, data point has a problem. Then you look at the velocity of the main using average velocities, pseudo velocities, where you have wells with no check shot, mapping your V0, calibrating your stacking velocities, either bulk scalar or well specific, or several stages. And depth domain using a tying via an error grid. So considerations using a well ties, for instance, when you're looking at depth domain, do you look for an absolute error? So i.e. 20 meters, 30 meters, plus 25 meters, plus 15 meters, etc. Or do you look by a percentage? So that's again a different philosophical way of looking at it. Plus also, how do you fit horizontal wells and how do you fit anomalies, which I'll come to in a minute. Sometimes you might need to deal with bus and well ties. So this is when you have a mismatch between adjacent wells. A narrow map looks like a magnetic, magnetic field. So you need to check, are the geological picks consistent? Are the surface locations valid? The well deviation surveys are valid. Basically, is your well point in the right place and has the right value? Are there any problems with well ch uh, check shots? Is interpretation consistent? Also, is there a geological reason? Maybe there's uh, sub-seismic faulting or a local high velocity uh, layer. Again. Something to look at tells you there's a problem. You need to look at what the problem might be. Now, fitting horizontal wells, now they can present as quite a challenge. So, as illustrated in this diagram, this is an example of something that I did personally face. So, the model fits at the reservoir entry point. So, the well comes in, and the well comes in, and then you have a initial grid, which means that the well pokes out, but it doesn't in reality. So, you then need to make an adjustment so that the corrected model fit, fully fits the data. Again, you can check that by looking at depth domain sections and visualization. 
or 3D visualization views because it doesn't show itself on the maps very easily. The other one is where you have a seismic anomaly. So this is an example from some work I did in the Eastern Mediterranean, where you have a flat spot with GWC, and that's confirmed in the well. And you need to make sure that um, the depth surface fits the flat spot, where it fits the GWC. So effectively, what you do is you put pseudo wells along the flat spot, where you know what the depth ought to be, and you make sure that uh, the velocity grid fits that. So the GWC now matches the flat spot. You now have a roughly correct volume. So well ties are often overlooked in seismic depth conversion interpretation. And quite often geophysicists are in a hurry to finish things off. They use a default flex, maybe sometimes because they don't know any different. It's quick and it normally looks OK. But sometimes it isn't. So you need to understand. You need to understand what you've done. You need to know the different algorithms have, may have significant effects. And need a QC results to avoid distortions. Do the maps look right? Is there a problem? And are these algorithms, uh, they're also used for modeling geological properties. So it's a good idea to be able to understand them. So thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one. And happy seismic mapping.